continue it down there and we move on and that's what happens conversation gets underway and often uh, a neutral topic such as where people are from or what they're interested in gets the ball rolling uh, people would say to me oh i heard you on the radio the other night you sounded very good and i said well what was i talking about i'm not sure but you sounded very good and i think most of all is we we both started our businesses with from nothing with, with no money so we had a real you know connection a real bond right from the very very start and as as adrian says for for a business owner it's, it's, it's a very lonely position there's nowhere really you can turn to there's no app you can refer to so you know when i first started 15 years ago I was very fortunate that I had someone I could turn to. And that is what mentoring is all about. I am absolutely amazed with what I've learned in this short while this afternoon. Fantastic. Thank you to everybody who has participated. And I would like to say a huge thank you to Anne and the Chamber for always supporting local business. It is amazing. So my name's Joe Murray. I'm the founder of a business called World Stores, as Anne says. Um, in a nutshell, we're a part technology business, uh, part retailer, and uh, we're ripping up the rule book, we think, for selling goods for the home. But you know, we have built a business which um, this year will probably turn over about 100 million pounds, and uh, we employ about 350 people. Um, I am the son of a photographer um, who is not a particularly business-minded person and uh, a farmer's daughter. Uh, I was brought up in rural Nottinghamshire. Um, I spent my childhood in the fields running around the village and I just loved it. Um, we we're five miles away from the nearest shop. Um, I was quite academic at school. I wasn't exactly uh, the uh, kind of top flyer, but I was, I was okay at school. Um, I found maths and science quite easy and um, I liked programming my little ZX Spectrum. Um, and then moved on to the BBC Micro. Um, when I was old enough, I started getting jobs. Uh, I did a paper round. I then went, uh, when I was 14, I went into Nottingham and got a job working in a flower shop, which all my friends thought was absolutely hilarious. And they would all come in and I would make them bouquets of flowers, um, which was uh, a lot of fun. Um, when I was 16, I took my tractor driving test and I went to work on the local farm. And for five out of six weeks, when I was from 16 to about 21, um, in the summer holidays, I worked on a farm. And I um, absolutely hated it. It was, you only got a day off when, you, when it rained. So I used to pray for rain all the time, and I still love rain. Um, I went, in the end, to Bristol University. I studied biology because, you know, um, it, I liked biology. It was going to be easy to study. And it was relatively easy. Um, and uh, I never left Bristol, got a decent degree, um, applied to the hardest job I could possibly think of, which was a bit of a mistake, really, but it was working in investment banking. Um, got a great job in a really good investment bank, uh, Deutsche Morgan Grenfell. Um, and uh, I, I sat on this desk where I was the only guy that hadn't been to Oxbridge. So they called me Thicko. And a friend of mine rang me up whilst I was living in Madrid, and he um, called Richard Tucker, and uh, he rang me up and said, um, I've got this really interesting internet idea. Um, why don't you find the money, uh, and, I'll, uh, you know, and, and I'll provide the idea? And essentially, it was a software company, the idea. And we were going to provide um, eCRM technology. So that's... Uh, for online businesses, trading online, and bear in mind this is 1999, 2000, it's pretty basic. Um, they needed a way of connecting their contact centers, which was traditionally all phone, to their customer base using email management, live chat, self-help technology thing. So we wrote a 25-page document. It took us about a week, and we poured over this thing. And uh, then we went around everybody saying, give us a million quid for 20% of the company. And somebody did. Um, <laughs> which was amazing, and uh, went to India to build this technology, which was um, actually really, really very good, uh, what we built. And we'd hired a load of um, decent guys here in the UK as well. Um, 
It took 18 months to build, and by the time we'd finished uh, building it, the dot-com crash had happened, and all our potential customers did no longer exist. So we had this great piece of technology. You know, we'd had this lucky break um, but, uh, to get the money, but we actually uh, didn't have anybody to sell it to. So we set up a business called Optelligence, which was to help large businesses navigate the world of search marketing, uh, search marketing. Now, we didn't know anything about search marketing, but we did know that a load of people who had been in dot-com businesses before they'd all got fired because their money ran out, uh, who we could then subsequently sell to. They were a customer base in waiting, we felt. Over on the internet, this little website, Sputnik Shop, uh, was doing quite well. And we'd been in the States. When I was in the States, I bought an iPod. And iPods had just launched, and I really liked my gadgets. Came back to the UK, and I tried to get um, my gadget, my iPod, connected to my car. And I tried to get a charger for it for the car. So using the search engine brain, we looked in our tools, which told us how many people are searching for iPod accessories per month. And you could see there was a massive amount of people in the UK looking for iPod accessories. And there were, say, 100,000 a month. And then 50,000 looking for iPod cases. And 10,000 looking for blue iPod cases. And I thought, well, you know what? I know what the demand is for this product. You don't have to go out and educate a market. You can just intercept traffic. You can intercept the demand that's out there. So we, we repurposed our Sputnik shop into a site called iPod World. And we both just sold our houses. And we had about 100 grand each. And um, we put it all into stock. But we thought we knew what we would be able to sell because we saw the keywords. We saw what people were looking for. And, um, and it did sell. So by Christmas, it all completely sold out. We made a fortune, like 20% margin or something. But we were, we were so delighted. So we went back to the search data. We looked at what were people looking for? What, where's the demand? And we settled upon furniture. And um, you know that was the sort of category out there, which was glaringly obvious. Nobody was doing a particularly good job in. But why weren't they doing a good job? Well, um, it's not an obvious one to do because it's really difficult to ship. It breaks. And it's highly fragmented market. So there are thousands and thousands of suppliers and zillions of products. Um, and it's not like you know, selling fridges or televisions online where you've got six suppliers and you know, they just change it every year and it's really, really easy. Furniture's tough. Um, but we thought, well, this is interesting. How, how do we approach that market? How do you challenge and, and sort of get into that segment? And so what we did is we took our technology guys from our At My Side days, and, and with that, we built a technology platform that allowed us to make search traffic work. So our solution to this was um, we would uh, get a technology platform that we would go around to, and we've now done it to 1,500 different suppliers around the UK and Europe, and sign them up to give us a daily feed of, or even more than that, of their, their product that's sitting in their shelves. So these are wholesalers or manufacturers. And so you know, there's one guy in Wales who literally sends us a fax once a month who says, yeah, I've still got the chairs. Yeah. And there's another guy who gives us an EDI feed. As soon as it goes out of stock in his warehouse, uh, we know and, it, and, it, and we pull it off the websites. So we have availability of their stock. So we use it, we're leveraging their stock positions as available to sell. So it's a bit like eBay, but the difference being that we are, we are the retailer. We're not a marketplace. We write the product listings. We make the retail margin. So we make the 40%, not the 10% that eBay would make. Um, but we have to do all the hard work. And when an order comes into one of our niche stores, so we built lots of these little niche stores, each around keywords. So we've got... Rabbit Hutch's world, kid you not, Log Splitter's world, um, Bedroom world, Mattress's world, loads of them, um, 96. And um, they're all centered around these keyword clusters. So when an order comes in, uh, we would then back to back that order through our tech platform via a web interface to the supplier's warehouse where they see the orders and they go, yeah, I've got those 10 products. I haven't got that 11th one. I've sold it since I gave you the product feed. That one. Um, we tell the customer quickly. The other 10, they go, yeah, I've got it. Press a button, a label printer, which we've given them words off. They slap the goods on, and then we know to send in a carrier to pick up the goods from their warehouse. And we do that to 250 different suppliers every day now. And we sell about 2,000 different um, items, uh, 2,000 different customers every day, 2,000 customers a day. I have some lessons that we've learned, and this is it, I'm nearly there. Um, 
If you can do it, do it with somebody else. So I've done it with Richard all along. We hate each other some of the time, but it's been invaluable. I've spent more time with him in, locked in a room than I have with my wife. Um, and, uh, you know, that's our, that's our joke. But, I mean, for 14 years now, we've worked uh, in the same office, day in, day out, 10-hour days. Um, believe in the numbers. Data is the key. You've got to test, iterate, test again. Thousands of tiny improvements make one big difference, and that's what we've really learned from online and everything we do. It's just all about the data. The other thing is someone else will eventually have your lunch unless you keep evolving. It's so easy to copy a business model, so hard to build an uncopyable one. So don't build an uncopyable one, just keep evolving and stay one step ahead of the copycats. Um, never compromise on your people. Um, you know, one thing I've never really found is the ability, when you know that somebody isn't working out, it's so rare that you can turn it around, that situation. And it's better for both of you. So don't stick too long with somebody who you know in, the heart, in your heart of hearts just isn't right. Um, investors, well, you know, I'm being recorded right now, I love my investors, but um, <laughs> remember, they're investing in you, not in your old business model that is out of date the moment the ink is dry. So as soon as you've taken their money, you have to think, right, what's best for the business right now? You've got board meetings, and you are accountable to them, and there is budget, but if you think something should change, don't stick to the old plan. Change the plan and persuade them of it. And that, that is the mistake so many venture-backed businesses make. They go, okay, well, this is my plan. Um, so, yeah, that's my journey so far. Very happy to talk to anybody about it. Um,